Good morning, and welcome to today's webcast, How Boards Provide ESG Oversight. Before we begin, I'm going to play a brief housekeeping video. Welcome, and thanks for joining. We're pleased to present our continuing professional education webcast series. Before we begin, please keep the following in mind. You can customize how you view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top right of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons that relate to a different aspect of our session. You can download a PDF of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget. You can ask questions by typing in the Q&A window and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session offers one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy requirements. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of polling questions. To participate in the polls, please check the button next to your answer within the slide window and click Submit. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE progress widget and download your CPE certificate. Don't worry if you can't download your CPE certificate today. We'll email you a copy in two weeks. If attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our group CPE attendance sheet available in our slide deck and handouts widget to receive credit. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. CPE credit can only be awarded to participants registered as themselves and isn't available for participants who view the on-demand version. This presentation is not legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. I'm pleased to introduce today's presenters from Moss Adams, Colleen Rosillas, business consulting partner, and Jesse Langhart, ESG Strategy Senior Manager. With that, I'll turn it over to Colleen to get us started. Great, thank you, Chad. Welcome everyone, we're really happy that you joined us today. Today we'll be going over a few areas. We'll start just with a high level overview of ESG for folks who aren't as familiar with it. And then we'll really dig into board and board committees and follow up with how to apply this information today. Um, as Chad mentioned, we're really happy to take questions throughout. If we have time at the end, we will get to them, um, but we will follow up with folks individually if not. Um, here are our required uh, CPE learning objectives for you all, and then we'll go right into this first poll. Chad, back to you. Thanks, Colleen. So our first polling question of the day, what is your role in your organization? A, board member, B, committee member, C, CEO, executive director, D, management, E, staff, or F, other not applicable. So if you select your answer and hit the submit button on your screen, your polling question will be recorded today. We'll give you about 15 to 20 seconds here to answer this polling question. And this starts us off easy with CPE, but it also helps us to see what who's in the room so that we can understand how to better customize this webcast for you all. So thank you. All right, give everyone about five more seconds here on this polling question. All right, let's advance on to the results here. All right, well, this looks like a pretty good spread of folks, quite a few board members here, so that's good. And then folks I see in kind of a, a board support role or providing information to boards. So I think this will be a really good spread of folks for Q&A as well. So Jesse, over to you. 
Great. Hello, everybody. So I'm going to walk us through a little bit about ESG. So we've heard a lot of things about what ESG is, what it isn't. So when we think about ESG and how it applies to boards, one of the best things to remember is that it is a lens and a framework that we can use to help us all understand and really look at and capture all of the things that we know are needed to be successful. So a lot of things that go into our organizations or your organization's success uh, can be captured on a balance sheet. So stuff like office space, your fleet, salaries, equipment, all of those things really um, are commonly found on balance sheets, but we know that your organization's value is a lot more than that. So thinking about things like your intellectual property, your brand reputation, your amazing culture, even your ethics or your governance practices, all of those are differentiators for your organization that feed into its success. So ESG really is and was developed as a way to bring all of those pieces together. So by doing this, we really help people better communicate their value, help you all better communicate your value, and then also really help you all better understand your risk environment. So when we think about the different pieces of criteria that go into understanding, understanding ESG, right, we've got these three buckets. So E, environmental, S, social, G, governance. So E captures all of the environmental related risks and opportunities that face your organization. This is a really big topic of conversation and often a lot of the primary focus for organizations that are kind of diving into ESG at least as a first step. We've known for a long time that the environment side of things is going to be the driver of a lot of ESG work, and that mostly is because it is more easily captured, it's more defined in terms of how it's able to be understood, and then it's a lot easier to put some um, data around it that is kind of consistent across organizations. So a lot of times when you look at the E um, and E criteria, that's things like energy use or kind of GHG or greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but for other organizations, it could also include things like if you consume a lot of water, um, if you use recycled materials in any of your products, if you are responsible for any waste disposal, um, and also honestly looks at things like whether or not your headquarters are located in a wildfire zone. So E really is the understanding of the risks and opportunities related to your environment. So then S. So S really thinks about your human capital and your social capital. And those are just two fancy ways of talking about um, the way that you manage your relationships internally with your employees, your internal stakeholders, the relationships that you have between your board um, and the management team. And then also kind of your social capital really looks at your external environment. So from the board perspective, again, really kind of thinking about how your company manages its relationships with supply suppliers, your customer base, and the communities that you operate in. So it really kind of speaks to also customer welfare, if you're producing any products, product safety, um, or if you are part of a foundation or in higher education, it could be the relationships that you have with your donors. The G side or the G bucket really captures, um, and why a lot of you are here, your governance related risks and opportunities. So. This looks at how well your organization manages organizational risk, competitive behavior, ethical practices, and how effective your board is at managing um, and providing oversight over your organization. So when we're looking at, okay, great, we've defined what is in the E, S, and G buckets. So what does measurement actually look like? So what we have here is an overview of the common um, metrics or pieces of data that is reported on when you're looking at kind of developing and understanding your, your ESG environment. So like I said, the environment side, it's a big topic of conversation. It's often the focus of a lot of ESG initiatives. Um, and you'll see, boom, greenhouse gas emissions are right on there, energy efficiency, renewable energy utilization, uh, and also your, your organization's policies and procedures related to, related to the environment. The social side really kind of looks at um, 
pay equity, diversity, equity, and inclusion, employee engagement, things like that, and then governance, corporate resiliency, your ownership structure, and your risk environment. So the important thing to remember when you are looking at the different types of ESG criteria or metrics that kind of fall within each of these buckets is that a lot of this list will get refined based on what's most likely to be material to your organization. So really kind of honing in on your specific inputs for value creation um, is really going to be a great lens that you can use to filter these metrics to see what is going to be the most relevant for you to report on and also what uh, folks are going to be looking for when they are comparing your organization kind of across the industry and among your peers. So when we look at right that lens that we use to filter the information that we put in a report, um, a lot of you may or may not be familiar with the huge alphabet soup of all of these standard setting entities. So um, when you are looking at this, it's important to remember that, you know, as much as um, financial standards were set up in a way to help us all understand and create comparable financial data, ESG standards are created in that same way, again, to help us put together meaningful and comparable data related to all of those intangible assets, right? All of the things under the E, S, and G buckets. So exactly like the evolution of how we ended up with financial standards, we are on a slow march towards uh, consolidated ESG reporting standards. So when there was the initial need to say, hey, we need a better way to report on some of this intangible data, our organizational culture, our intellectual property, how well we treat our employees, um, there was a response. So that is how we ended up kind of with this broad swath of uh, standard setting entities. So they were all created with a little bit different view on how to report on ESG related information. Some focused on the environment, some focused on the social, some focused on the governance, some of them had all of them. Um, but the important thing to remember is that we are and have seen even over the last six months that a lot of these major standard setting entities are beginning to align their frameworks. So just as a recap, some highlights since June 2023. So the International Financial Reporting Standards, IFRS, published two standards, S1 and S2, that integrate elements of the frameworks that you see here. So TCFD, SASB, CDSB. And then in July, one month later, 2023, it was announced that IFRS um, is their International Sustainability Standards Board it was going to take over responsibility for monitoring progress of a company's disclosures who are using TCFD, right? So again, kind of bringing together reporting and monitoring under kind of one umbrella. Then in October, um, CDP announced that it would align its sustainability reporting questionnaire to the S1 and S2 that was published back in June. And then again, just one month later in November, GRI established sustainab the Sustainability Innovation Lab, which um, was coordinated alongside IFRS, again, to further identify ways to align reporting standards. Also in November, November was a big month, um, CDP announced that it would also work to maximize its alignment with EFRAG, which are the European Standards for Sustainability, uh, to really accelerate the uptake of uh, the European Sustainability Reporting Standards, so ESRS. So that was a very long-winded way of saying that we are on our way and there is a lot of momentum towards adopting global standards and that work is still ongoing. So the great news for all of you tuning in today is that when you are looking at, great, like ESG, know what it's about, how do I pick a framework, what metrics do I use to report on my ESG data, um, you can pick one and odds are that there are going to be increasing areas of overlap with other frameworks. So the level at which you're going to need to customize or redo or adapt your information is going to continue decreasing. Again, kind of making it easier for you all to think about producing an ESG report 
aligning with some standards, making sure that you're getting data that's going to be really useful um, to report on. So I'm going to pass it back over to Colleen, who is going to chat to you about the board's responsibilities. Great. Thank you, Jesse. So when we think about the board as a whole and ESG, there are a lot of um, concerns about how much the board really needs to lean in and what is the appropriate level because so much of the ESG is operational. When we think about governance kind of big picture, it's not just the folks seated at that boardroom table, but it's really about the structures and systems, what our framework is for governing the organization. And um, we're thinking about things like how the CEO makes decisions and operationalizes the strategic plan, how we're achieving our organizational mission, and the accountability of the board to management that they're making decisions in an effective manner. There are a lot of different governance frameworks folks use. You know, there's policy governance, there's consensus-based governance. We can use Robert's rules of order to our heart's content. But really, regardless of the framework, the board has some key responsibilities here. So establishing that mission, vision, and strategy that defines what your company's place is within your community, within your marketplace, however you want to define yourself. That's the, the strategic framework there. Setting that kind of longer term direction for the organization as well. So setting goals, setting performance measures, monitoring outcomes against that plan, and then developing a higher level um, policies that are really focused on the bigger picture of the organization. Looking at the behavior and performance of other board members, of the CEO, if the board has its own attorney or in-house attorney, that's also some place where boards can lean in, and also monitoring financial and operational performance. As Jesse mentioned, the story of a company is not just within its financial statements, but much broader. And so this is really that, that place around accountability where the board can lean into ESG. And then something that can sometimes get missed is providing goodwill and support. So as a board member, you're not just in a role kind of advisory to the CEO. You're also part of the leadership team of the organization and charged with really supporting it and moving it forward. So that means how we represent the company to external parties, how we're positioned within our industry, within our community, that really supports the organization and moves it forward. We want to ask tough questions. We want to dig into information um, to get the right answers, but we're also there as setting the tone, ultimately. So I think probably since Sarbanes-Oxley, a lot of folks have heard a lot about fiduciary duty and what is important for board members. It's kind of broken down into three areas. So we have a duty of care, which means that we have to come to the table with a level of competence, judgment, and also really making sure that we're engaged. We don't want to be kind of up too high in a, a rubber stamp board. We also have a duty of loyalty, so thinking about organizational interest versus own self-interest, and either avoiding or disclosing any conflicts of interest as possible. As long as we're upfront about these things, then they can be dealt with very directly. And then there's obedience, so keeping us on course to both accomplish our goals and having that accountability piece, but also obeying the law. So in the United States, there aren't any official ESG regulations out there yet. There's work happening in California to get up off the ground, and we expect the SEC to issue a final rule, um, hopefully this quarter. But at that point, there also will be sort of looking at kind of the validity of metrics, understanding what we're disclosing, and boards really feeling comfortable with that. So how that is accomplished is really approaching our work in, I think, a trust but verify mindset, right? So we want to ask questions. We also want to be able to ask help if there's areas where we don't have expertise. And staff and management should be providing information to the board that is relevant, accessible, you know, a 500-page report nobody's going to read. I, you know, today I would say probably nobody's going to read a 10-page report. So really thinking about what information can we get to board members that's meaningful, concise, and helps them to um, make decisions effectively. A board, another place where this really aligns with ESG is around that fiduciary responsibility and 
safeguarding your assets, right? So we're taking a look at the annual budget. We oversee risk management. We're responsible for internal controls and making sure that that is in a good place. And also thinking about if your board have representation on either subsidiaries or partners because they may be going in different directions in terms of operational data, in terms of the goals of those particular organizations related to ESG. And so we want to make sure disclosures, data, information really lines up there and that the board members who are serving on those potential boards and committees are both representing the organization effectively, but then also making sure that they're serving the mission of those subsidiaries and partners. And that can be kind of a tricky line to walk that we definitely suggest involving legal in those discussions. And I'm gonna pass it back to Jesse to dig in a little bit more to the whole board and ESG. Great, so Colleen talked a lot about the board's fiduciary responsibility and it's kind of one one area, again, thinking again about the, the broader look and responsibilities of a board for ESG overall. Um, the biggest one that also is kind of a key area of responsibility and oversight really is kind of making sure that ESG is not an additive layer on top of what your organization is doing. So really making sure that, you know, the ESG work that is probably 99.9% .9 likely already taking place within your organization is showing up in and integrated with your organization's strategy, its risk management practices, and is a part of decision making. You know, exactly like Colleen mentioned, if you are part of a board that also operates um, with a few subsidiaries, really having an eye on the way that decision making information risk management flows throughout your entire organization is going to be really important. You know, the next one really, again, connected to that is making sure that your ESG priorities are aligned. We don't wanna inadvertently cannibalize any of our ESG work that's taking place. And so surfacing a lot of those initiatives, connecting them to your organization's mission, its vision, and again, its long-term goals, it's gonna be really, really relevant. Um, and also, again, making sure that it's integrated with any regulatory requirements, um, uh, as well. And that also looks at, so not only kind of federal and state regulatory requirements, there are also some um, requirements over and kind of regulations around ESG frameworks. And so thinking about any kind of updates in that area and continually scanning your environment is going to be really important. Um, Defining targets and metrics. So again, deeply involved in your in your strategy. So really making sure that you're promoting kind of identifying which metrics are going to be the most material, the most relevant to your organization. Again, thinking about your industry and those key inputs to how you to your organization's success or its value creation are going to be important again to filter that data. We are in a deeply data rich environment. We could report on anything. Whether or not it's meaningful to your organization and your industry is going to be really important to filter all of that information through. And then the last part, when you have filtered your information and you've defined your metrics that are going to be really relevant, both internally to your organization, but then also from the outside, when you are looking at how you compare to your peers, um, we want to make sure that as a board, we are uh, doing a good job calibrating the level of quality um, that goes into our reporting and the level of controls that we have over our data. Um, so when we think about what to kind of measure that against, a really good uh, barometer is to use the controls that you have over your financial reporting and practices. So really making sure that um, you have the same level of oversight, the same level of integrity that goes into monitoring, tracking, and organizing your data that goes, that goes into your ESG reporting and then also your initiatives. One of the most common questions that we get from folks is to figure out uh, the roles and responsibilities between a management team and a board team. So ESG as kind of this um, emerging hot topic and kind of 
um, priority for a lot of organizations. What's happening is we, we're finding that a lot of ESG initiatives, uh, responsibilities for reporting, how that looks and how that's carried out in an organization is often spearheaded by someone who's really passionate about it, is really into the data, um, or has, you know, in some cases kind of been voluntold to carry out ESG within the organization. So what happens is a lot of times those folks don't have the authority, they don't have the level of oversight, they don't have the support really to kind of carry out effective ESG practices or reporting or initiatives. And so um, it's, you know, from the ground up, thinking about then as you can, as your organization continues to evolve and mature, how the board really can kind of step in and like Colleen mentioned, be the promoter, set the tone for the organization and really guide and direct a lot of those initiatives. So when we're thinking about kind of the future of ESG and roles and responsibilities, who is supposed to really do what, um, here's a really great way to kind of frame both of those. And again, depending on the level of maturity and the resources available within your organization, there could be a little bit of overlap, but in an ideal state, kind of working towards this breakdown where the board guides and directs, and then the executive team or the manager really operationalizes a lot of that work. So the board's deciding what, it's considering issues, it's monitoring progress, uh, it contracts with the executive director, the CEO, refuse and approves budgets. And then the management team or the executive team really provides the recommendations. They implement the plans, they report on progress, uh, and then they formulate kind of the budget and how that shows up within an organization. So, when you think of ESG um, and kind of the role of ESG and the board in the organization, it's helpful to think of it as a cycle. So ESG isn't static. A lot of times ESG within your organization, right, if it's integrated into your strategy, will flow in a cadence aligned with kind of annual reporting or kind of strategic plan reporting and will get reviewed and evaluated and assessed and reported out kind of on those cycles. So it could happen annually, it could happen once every five years. And the board has a, a different kind of orientation and primary role across each of those phases. So when we think about uh, the, the very beginning, uh, uh, when you are setting your strategy or if you're renewing your strategic plan and you are revising or editing or updating your strategy, the board's role really at that point, again, is to be the promoter, right? Set the goals, guide guide the um, initiatives, and really be responsible for um, establishing this as a priority for the organization and how that can show up. Then, you know, when you think about how ESG is carried out within your organization, um, and those various initiatives, a couple of things. So the board is often gonna be responsible for receiving a lot of that information, but are often also the focus of some ESG reporting criteria. So your actions, um, any kind of training, your board composition sometimes come under scrutiny when we're looking at how ESG initiatives are carried out. So it's part of that G bucket of items when you're looking at kind of a comprehensive and integrated ESG strategy. Then when we get to reporting, again, really making sure that the board is in a position to provide those accountability measures, um, really making sure that sufficient internal controls are in place, that they're receiving quality information, decision use useful information, and then also can um, guide and direct the how information is shared out to its customers, to its shareholders, to external folks, really to kind of make sure that that information um, is, is reaching the right, right people and able to do the right thing. So this is a horizontal way of looking at kind of some of the, the previous tables that we looked at, but really underlines uh, the board's role, again, to oversee, guide, direct, and really promote, set the tone, and then management's role really, again, to operationalize a lot of the ESG initiatives. So where the board is looking at educating, integrating, monitoring, and overseeing a lot of the work, then the management team is really identifying those risks and opportunities. It's incorporating each of those into its strategy. It's thinking about 
the metrics that are uh, to be reported on, how that information is gathered, and what things and people need to be in place, again, in order to really kind of make that a living, breathing initiative um, and really kind of part of your organization rather than, you know, kind of like I said, that just layer on top. So I'm going to pass it back to Chad uh, to take us through our next polling question. Thanks, Jesse. And we have our second polling question of the day. Does your organization issue an ESG report? Either A, yes. B, we have a strategy but are not reporting yet. C, no. Or D, I don't know. So if you select your answer and hit the submit button on your screen, your polling question will be recorded today. We'll give you about 15 to 20 seconds to answer this polling question. All right, we're almost at about 90%, so we'll give you about five more seconds here. All righty, gonna advance on to the results. All right, thank you, Chad. Well, this looks like a relatively, um, I would say, ahead of the curve group of folks because I would say typically when we ask folks if they have an ESG report issued, it's not very many in the audience. So kudos to this team for actually getting those reports out there. Um, and to have just about yes and no, just about even, that sounds about um, right to us kind of thinking about the, the bigger landscape of um, companies internationally. And if you answered no, you are not behind because, again, as Jesse mentioned, we don't have consistent standards. We don't have regulations in the U.S. out there yet. And so there are a lot of folks just kind of holding back. So I'm going to go through board committees and what their role is in monitoring ESG. For most companies, that the ESG real kind of data work is functioning at that board committee level. Um, and for some companies, it might be uh, the right approach to actually delegate oversight of ESG to a standing ESG committee. For others, it's to an existing board committee. So it might be, for example, the nominating committee or the audit committee, or if you have a risk committee, um, especially if it's kind of a new area of focus for you. It's a lot of work to stand up an ESG function. I'm sure those folks who are um, part of management and staff who are on this webcast can attest to that. Um, and so the idea is if there's expertise already kind of at that committee level, let's leverage that. Um, and the companies that do that are thinking about also, could we change the name of those committees so that kind of uh, updates their expanded responsibility. So adding sustainability, for example, or adding ESG to the name of an existing committee. Um, and we can also think about a committee structure in a way of like, you've got committees that work for you. Not every organization is going to be the same in terms of committees and might not want to reallocate their committees to respond to something like ESG, but it also is going to depend on what your legal requirements are and what corporate governance looks like. So if you're a company headquartered in California, this is something that you have to lean into right now, um, depending on the size of your organization, depending on the complexity. That's all something that we want to think about because we ultimately like fiduciary responsibility, we look at ESG through that risk-based framework. So I'm going to start with, if you have a standalone committee, if it is set up maybe new or we're expanding from just sustainability to the broader realm of ESG, this approach really digs into kind of in-depth discussion of ESG, and it looks at addressing ESG risk very um, compartmentalized maybe from the other board committees. There is a risk from looking at it this way. And what we would suggest is if you are setting up an ESG committee, especially at the beginning, to make sure you've got representatives of key other committees like 
compensation, audit or risk, nominating and governance, any other committees that might be involved in those specific issues that Jesse went over in the beginning. Um, by having this one committee, you can help to streamline reporting and you can coordinate between committees, but you also really want to make sure that you're all sharing information. I also wanted to know, you know, kind of thinking about where standalone ESG committees are today. So a recent assessment of S&P 500 companies noted that only 13% of those had an ESG committee at the board level. But for those um, UK-based companies that are on the um, Financial Times Index, over 50% of those companies had an ESG standalone committee. So that really reflects that kind of difference in maturity and the regulatory market between U European and U.S. companies. But as we're thinking about kind of that global marketplace, it's absolutely something that we want to consider as well. ESG is often covered in the governance and nominating committee when we think about our governance practices, our board education, what committees are actually responsible for ESG, right? That's something that the governance and nominating committee would absolutely look at. Political contributions, public policy, how we monitor that, how we set policy for that, that's absolutely an important piece of that as well. And as Jesse mentioned in the beginning, when your company is looked at for appropriate governance, they're looking at the activities of that governance and nominating committee. So what is our board composition? What's our nominating and onboarding process? What does board diversity look like to us? And what are our goals around that area? Those are all things that a board wants to consider when tasking a governance and nominating committee with both overseeing core areas of ESG within their purview, but then also reporting out on their activities to the full board and externally. Investment committee is a place where I think in a lot of organizations, ESG has already been around for a long time. So if you think about something like ethical-based investing, that started in the 1960s with the idea of we might want to have our investment portfolio match up with our organizational values. This is a huge area in the not-for-profit space, foundations, and in higher education as well. We actually had a question in the Q&A about this, so I think this is really um, timely and something to think about is the investment committee and the board establish the investment policy for the organization and monitor investments for return but with, it, with a broader ESG perspective, we might also identify what our priorities for investments are. So do we have priorities for investing in companies that have made a carbon neutral goal, for example? Do we want to invest in companies with a social purpose? Right? Those are things that the investment committee would really want to lean into. But you also have to think about managing your company's risk tolerance in that and really balancing how much risk you want to take versus how far you want to go in terms of that values-based uh, approach. There are a number of different approaches to investments from that sort of ethical and socially responsible um, place to more um, collaborative investment approaches like impact investing uh, or systems-level investing where companies are maybe partnering with governments, with not-for-profits or foundations, and really leaning into kind of project-based, community-based investments that do at some point have a return, but it's also more about maybe that social impact there. And we are seeing in some companies that are more mature, a subcommittee of the investment committee really focused on ESG or sustainable or responsible investing. And this is because the marketplace is just moving really quickly. And a big part of even setting up these policies is about reputational risk and your positions related to your reputation and other companies' reputations. And so you have to monitor really closely, actually, those companies that you invest in because you don't want to be uh, on the second page of the newspaper for maybe an issue that ended up on the first page of the newspaper or the subject of anyone's uh, Facebook post, if we can avoid it. So the audit committee is a place where we also see a tremendous amount of oversight to around ESG because a big part of ESG is managing organizational operational risks. And so we're seeing a lot of audit committees leaning into ESG in terms of risk identification, adding ESG into that risk register, 
overseeing ESG risk, so understanding your controls, understanding your organization's procedures of actually management monitoring ESG risk, what's included there, how your external auditor looks at ESG, how your internal auditor looks at ESG, establishing and monitoring those performance measures, and then assuring that that work uh, related to your risk is reported and disclosed, that it is consistent, that it makes sense. You know, your ESG disclosures, if they don't align with your financial statements and other disclosures, people will notice that gap and pick on that gap versus what you are reporting in the story that you want to tell. So even if the data is not necessarily in 100% alignment because it might be a different reporting period or have different assumptions, you can still report it. Just make sure that those assumptions are very clear. If your board has a risk committee, it's likely that it's going to cover some of these activities also. When we think about that particular committee, which is, is maybe sort of common, less common certainly than having an audit committee or an investment committee, that committee might look exactly at that kind of ESG and climate-related risk and monitor those very specifically and specific compliance, but you would still want a connection to the audit committee there because there is an overlap in terms of their purview. Another place where the board uh, really leans into ESG is in compensation, executive compensation, and how that is reported. It is a huge topic of conversation. It's something that is regularly rolled into the S in ESG. And many executives, um, particularly at large companies, now have ESG goals, DEI goals, sustainability goals rolled into their compensation packages. That's something that has to be established by the compensation committee, having policies in place for that, having other policies related to the rest of the organization as well. So while the CEO is delegated operational matters, the board may very clearly establish policies related to pay equity, to succession planning, and what those selection processes look like, would monitor reports on employee engagement, turnover, retention, and recruitment, how folks are advanced, and then overall kind of human capital management. So when we think about health and safety, we think about setting the tone for the organization's culture. Those are all things that are regularly dealt with at the compensation committee level and that would be established in policy. And then even though I said this section was about committees, we also want to make sure this work doesn't stay just at the committee level. We want it to go to the whole board. As I mentioned right at the top, this is going to vary between organizations depending on how large your board is, depending on how complex your organization is. In some organizations, this all stays right at the board level. But once the board decides on whatever its approach is, Look at the policies and governance documents, committee charters, and guidelines to make sure those are updated. I think that's the place where we see often boards and companies really fall short is we change the way we operate and we don't adjust our policies to reflect that. And that can expose you to risk that you simply do not want. Um, and so just updating those charters and having a look at them every couple of years is a really strong governance practice. We also um, are thinking about the whole board in terms of setting that direction for ESG strategy, using it as a lens to think about strategy. That's something that you can incorporate into your discussions and into the information that's provided to the board on a regular basis. There, because there's no uniform template, because we don't have um, that sort of guideline yet, although we're moving toward that, um, we want to make sure that we've got the expertise on the board as well. So boards are looking for folks who have sustainability experience. Most boards have at least one CPA and one attorney on your board. And so that's going to be a place where you want to ask them what their expertise is. And if they don't have expertise in these areas, either providing training to the board or seeking out folks that have that expertise can be of really um, of great value to you. So the other things that the board should really look at are the policies, right? So we're thinking about organizational risk and strategy, but also making sure that policies are in place, that reporting is appropriate and consistent, because ultimately the board does sign off on this and does have ultimate responsibility for what that reporting is, in, is and that it's correct. And then I would say, because this is moving so fast, that the board has a regular check-in, is this the right structure in place? 
are we really governing our ESG and sustainability data in a way that we can answer very clear, clearly what direction are we going, how are we getting there, where are the potential gaps, and how are we actually proving that we are moving in the correct direction. And you may change roles and responsibilities between committees and the board, specific board members, and even management over time as you're asking those questions. So Chad, back to you for a third poll. Thanks, Colleen. And we have our third polling question of the day. Where is ESG overseen in your organization? Either A, the whole board, B, sustainability committee, C, audit committee, D, compensation committee, E, a combination of committees, F, governance and nomination, nominating committee, or G, I'm not sure. So if you select your answer and hit the submit button, your polling question will be recorded today. I'll give you about 15, 20 seconds to answer this one. And while you're answering this question, we had a question in the Q&A around how much more work you could expect your external auditor to do related to ESG. At this point, a lot of what we're seeing is actually a separate assurance of ESG sustainability data, as opposed to it being rolled into the financial statement audit. We've said that quite a few times, this is a really fast moving area, but we're, we're still seeing kind of those separate reports and separate data as a separate effort. And so that level of effort is really gonna depend on what sort of data you're disclosing. Jesse, do you have anything you might wanna to add to that? I, you know, not a lot to add. The only other thing that I would say is that when you are going out and kind of looking at who could be a good person or a good entity to provide that level of assurance, there, um, as part of the SEC proposed rule that we're looking at finalizing, you know, fingers crossed in the next quarter, in it, you know, it does call for some level of assurance over kind of ESG reporting, but it doesn't give folks a lot of great insight into who is best suited to do that. When you look kind of across the landscape of folks who could provide assurance, um, I think there is a very natural segue into, um, you know, CPA for, you know, at the risk of knowing who who's doing the presentation. Um, CPA firms are often, or whatever CPA firm that you use to provide your external um, your external audit are often really well suited to provide assurance over your ESG reports because they understand the framework of how all of that is meant to come together. A lot of times um, you may see uh, that you have really specific um, kind of reviews or assurance provided over environmental reports by environmental engineers. So when you are kind of going out and looking at the type of assurance that's provided and who's doing it, um, again, kind of being thoughtful about who you're reporting to, the level of integrity that's going to be required or kind of the depth of the assurance or review that you need in order to, again, kind of make sure that the entities that um, you are reporting to have that level of kind of assurance over, over what you're providing. Okay. Again, a little bit of an even spread here um, with some compensation and governance and nominating committee kind of uh, as the caboose of this train. So um, again, really not surprising based on what we're seeing. So a combination of committees makes a ton of sense, um, especially when we're looking at how ESG really is the umbrella of a lot of these different initiatives that are, again, likely already taking place within your organization. Um, and then also thinking about this, the level of maturity for people in their ESG journey and the resources that are available uh, in order to provide that kind of level of oversight guidance uh, coming together. All right, so I'm gonna talk about um, some effective ESG practices. So when we are thinking about how ESG is carried out, uh, across the organization, you know, we chatted a lot about roles and responsibilities between the board, between the management team, how that can really shift again, based on the 
level of maturity of ESG within your organization, who's carrying it out, also the level of resources available. So a lot of times we just don't have the personnel nor the funds available to really invest in the ESG initiative or dream team that you know we would we would hope for. So when we think about ESG practices uh, across the organization and what's going to be really important, especially for the board to think about and um, at going forward, number one really is understanding your risks. So ESG is an incredibly cool tool um, to help you all better understand kind of your risk environment. Get that deeper and next level next level layer of understanding where your risks are coming from that are unique to your industry. So we've kind of chatted about it throughout this presentation. It's really understanding um, that your organization should continue to be in the driver's seat of a lot of your ESG initiatives. It should be tailored to your industry, to your organization, what you know you need to be successful, whether that's materials, people, a strong brand reputation, how you show up in your investments, um, and things like that. So understanding uh, your risks is going to be kind of the best way that you can apply ESG in your organization, really, again, to better understand what those are, and then really think about some strategies for mitigating those risks. You know, as soon as you start measuring um, risks in these different areas and reporting on this criteria, you'll start to see opportunities to, you know, again, like I said, mitigate those risks, which builds a little bit of organizational resiliency. The next up, um, and again, cannot emphasize this enough, is that ESG really doesn't need to be just a layer that you put on top of the work that you're already doing. It really should be kind of pulling up and highlighting and bringing together all of the work that you very likely are already doing. If your organization regularly updates its compensation policies, if your organization regularly has an eye on its um, kind of supply chain, if your organization already has an eye on how it's making its investments, then that type of work is just all gets reported and uh, put under the umbrella of ESG, right? It's just a useful framework in order for you to better communicate your story and also develop your strategy in order to make sure that you are able to um, kind of carry out a lot of the initiatives that you already have underway and in a way that's kind of comparable to other companies in your industry. So really making sure that you're regularly reviewing and updating your own strategic plan, identifying those ESG related initiatives that are already in there, um, and then identifying your priorities and how, again, that kind of shows up in the long term, your long term goals. The next part that we've also talked a lot about and Colleen really highlighted when, uh, during kind of that committee overview is the importance of communication. So again, because ESG really is kind of an enterprise wide lens and umbrella to understand all of these initiatives that we have going on within our organization that fall kind of within those buckets. It's going to be really important to continue to reinforce and place additional importance on how information is shared from the management team to the board, from the board to its committees, across committees. Um, again, really making sure that everybody, as we like to say, is in the same boat, rowing in the same direction. So once we have that strategy in place, we're able to really kind of identify our, and our priority initiatives, our goals, we're able to respond to our regulatory environment. We wanna make sure that everybody has the same set of tools and the same roadmap um, that they to follow uh, over the over the next five years so or kind of however long your strategic plan lasts so again kind of making sure that that information is shared up down and all around is going to be really really important it also lends that level of kind of internal controls and helps you all not you know unintentionally cannibalize your F, your ESG efforts across the organization or even your subsidiaries. So one of the other things I want to um, talk about alongside communication really is reporting. So we chatted a lot about um, how you can use the same internal controls you have over financial reporting to inform your ESG reports. Talked about the importance of picking metrics that are going to be really relevant to your organization, 
talked a lot about kind of how to apply different reporting mechanisms that you can use to communicate ESG really transparently, again, internally or across committees, but then also externally. Again, to those folks who need to know that information, it could be um, the uh, labor pool, it could be investors, could be any number of folks. Um, and so the other part about kind of communication and reporting, again, is to, to continue monitoring your regulatory environment. Um, as Colleen mentioned, there are a couple of state-led ESG-related initiatives, again, really kind of being driven by a lot of those environmental priorities that are uh, that are popping up. And then, you know, we're hoping in the next quarter that there's going to be some SEC final rules. There are rules already in place um, if you are an international organization. So continuing to scan, have that head on a swivel, really making sure that you're monitoring the regulatory environment and able to respond proactively is going to put you in a really strong position. And this is another really important takeaway is to uh, think about continuous improvement. So uh, mentioned a couple of times also that the, the landscape of ESG is changing really rapidly. You know, I talked about the ways that the reporting frameworks, the standards, the different regulations have kind of evolved even over the last six months. Um, and they will continue to do so. They're gonna, again, continue that kind of slow march towards consolidation. And so when we have better data, we use better data. So as a board, really kind of thinking about the reporting that you get, you know, and as Colleen mentioned, making sure that all of the dots are connected between your different reports in order to um, kind of build that level of integrity kind of between the pieces of information that you are using in the, the full array of your reporting that you're providing and having that all connect back to your ESG or your um, sustainability or your kind of social responsibility report. It's gonna be really important, really clarifying what assumptions you're using. Um, and as that evolves, there is a really common understanding that your ESG reporting will also likely evolve. Again, this can be driven by a couple of different things. It could be changes to reporting frameworks. It could be changes to the materiality of different pieces of information. We know that that's incredibly dynamic as our environment changes. And so keeping up with that and knowing that your ESG report will evolve over time is incredibly normal. What we don't want to do is kind of hide any changes or have it not be well communicated in our reports. And so being able to make sure that you are able to draw the line between updates that are made kind of based on either new pieces of data or new requirements or different uh, priorities surfacing kind of over time, really making sure that that is part of your regular um, reporting environment, but then also your initiatives. So that is also one of the really big questions that we get is, hey, we know that diversity is really important to our stakeholders. It's not super strong within our organization right now. We want to make it so but we don't wanna kind of put together a report that would or kind of issue any information that doesn't kind of cast us in the best light. So progress over perfection, I think is the biggest um, biggest takeaway when we think about continuous improvement. Um, nobody, I mean, everybody likes a really good upward trend line. So where you can kind of put that in your reports, more is the better. But the other, uh, the other key piece here is that if you don't tell your story, then someone else will. So where you can be the driver, that's going to be um, really important. So I'm going to pass it over to Chad to take us through our very last uh, polling question and then read us out. Thanks, Jesse. And we have our fourth polling question of the day. When was your last board retreat? They're A, 2023, B, 2021 or 22, C, 2020 or before, D, we've never had a retreat, or E, I'm not sure. I'll give you about 10 to 15 seconds here to answer this one. You just select your answer and hit the submit button. Your polling question will be recorded. I give you about five more seconds here. All right. 
right, let's go into the results. All right. Great. So somewhat even split. Some folks, well, I guess not even, uh, really benchmarked. Some folks, 2023, and then other folks, not sure, which makes a lot of sense kind of based on who we have as attendees. But we're at the top of our time. Chad, please feel free to read us out. Thanks, Colleen and Jesse, for a great presentation today. If we didn't have time to answer your questions, we'll do our best to follow up with you after the webcast. As a reminder, if you attended today's presentation in a group and would like to receive CPE credit, you must complete the group attendance sheet found in the slide deck and handouts window. If you participated as an individual and met all certification requirements, your certification is available for download now in your CPE progress window. I'll keep the webcast console open for a few minutes to give you time to download your CPE certificate. A copy of your CPE certificate will be emailed within three weeks should you have any difficulty downloading it now. And here is a link to an online survey where you can provide feedback for today's presentation. Please take a moment to complete this survey as your feedback is very important to us. And we thank you again for joining us today and hope you'll join us again next time.